Hi, thanks for joining me today as we spend a little time discussing something that from an automotive perspective is one of the most important developments really of the last half century, and that is the widespread addition and presence of detergents in our nation's gasoline supply. I am Eric Bjornsson. I'm the Technical Information Director here at Bell Performance in Longwood, Florida. And what we want to cover today is we want to cover three main things, right? The first thing is uh, we want to start with some context uh, by considering the process by which we go from crude oil taken out of the ground to the gasoline that you get at the pump. Now, the reason we want to do this is that there are some important considerations that will give some, uh, you know, some useful explanatory context to the second point we want to cover, which is uh, the detergency in the gasoline, what it does. Uh, they put detergency in the gas for specific reasons, and those are important considerations that if we really want to understand it, we need to understand what those are. And then lastly, we want to bring this all home by talking about the top tier detergency standard. Now that's a term that you might have heard before. We're gonna explain what it is and, and we're gonna explain why it is a good thing for our nation's drivers. So let's, uh, let's start at the beginning. Let's start at what, what happens after they extract crude oil from the ground. They pull it out of the ground, now what? How do we get from that to the usable fuel products that we know as consumers. So uh, at its simplest, the process is divided into five parts. And if we examine these five parts of the process, and there are some things that we may not have realized before that will uh, probably jump out at us. So step number one, of course, uh, the crude oil is extracted from the ground and held in temporary storage tanks. Then the crude oil is distributed to one of 142 refineries across the United States. As we're right for right now, we are limiting our discussion to the United States. So there are 142 refineries, and uh, that crude oil is distributed to them primarily either through pipeline or through tanker ships or barges. Uh, it is then refined at the refinery into finished products, which will include gasoline, diesel fuel, uh, you'll get uh, LPG and natural gas, uh, and you will also get home heating oil uh, as well. Then the fourth step in the process, um, the refined fuel is transported from the refinery to terminals or distribution terminals, and it is stored in common tanks at those distribution terminals. Now that is done by truck or pipeline tanker ship or barge. Now at this point, if we're talking about gasoline, okay, this refined product, this is base gasoline, and it is still at this point not ready for use by retailers because a detergent additive package has not yet been blended into the fuel. So the, the distribution terminals have all of this refined base gasoline in large holding tanks and they are waiting for orders. So a retail gas station or a, a, a bulk fuel user, they, uh, they place an order for a particular product. And when the order is placed, they take a tanker truck, they fill it up at the terminal with base gasoline. And then, very importantly, at that point, they take a detergent added package, one that is specific to that retailer, and they blend that into the base gasoline, and then they deliver it to the customer. So the biggest difference here and the first thing we really need to understand, the biggest difference between the different brands of gasoline, difference between Exxon, uh, Texaco, Shell, um, uh, BP, uh, you know, uh, Racetrack, um, you know, any of those, the biggest difference between the different brands of gasoline is the additive package. The additive package is what differentiates those brands. And the key element, the biggest element uh, of that uh, added package, the most important element is the detergency, the detergent package that is the key component of that additive package. So that's the way things are right now, but things were not always like they are now. 
Uh, when did they start adding detergent to the gasoline supply? Is it a relatively new thing? It is, is it something that they have always done and we haven't really uh, paid attention to it? Well, taking from talking from a macro perspective, it was only uh, really in the 19, starting in the 1970s, that companies started using what they call deposit control additives on a wide or a broad scale. Now, deposit control, when you see deposit control, think detergency because deposit control is one of the key elements of a detergent package. So, these deposit control additives were first added to gasoline on a widespread basis in the 1970s. Now, over the years since then, the industry had long recognized that deposits in injectors uh, that's for fuel injected engines and uh, deposits on intake valves, those were things that really negatively affected uh, engine performance. And so the fuels industry responded to the problem of injector deposits and intake valve deposits by formulating uh, detergent packages that were, had, were proven to be pretty effective at removing deposits in both of these areas, the fuel injectors and the intake valves. Unfortunately, what they found was that uh, if they were really effective at, at cleaning injectors and valves, the converse downside was that they resulted in an excess of combustion chamber deposits. And this problem was so bad in some engines that there ended up being mechanical interference between the pistons and the valves and the cylinder heads that would, uh, in a number of cases, result in engine failure. So the industry has a problem here. Well, the industry being creative and smart as it is, well, they respond by developing different detergent chem chemistries. And those proved themselves were proven to be effective at solving this problem, removing uh, and keeping deposits from building up in fuel injectors and intake valves, but also limiting solving this problematic buildup of deposits in the combustion chamber. So at this point, we are so far so good stage. So now we fast forward you know, 20, 25 years, we come to 1996 and now you get other things that are starting to happen. Um, the EPA is, uh, is, you know, one of their mandates is that they look at in the environment, they look at things like air quality. And in 1992, Congress passes the Clean Air Act. And uh, the con and so as in, in response to a congressional mandate coming out of this, the EPA is examining the air quality in urban areas, and it is not good. Many of these urban areas are failing required air quality standards. And the EPA recognizes that a key contributing reason for this is the exhaust from all of those automobiles in those urban areas. So what does the EPA do? Well, the EPA establishes uh, what they call the lowest additive concentration, they, or the LAC standard. And they, they really implement this or start implementing it in 1996. And this requirement, this LAC requirement says that all on-road gasoline sold was now required to contain a minimum, a, at least a minimum level of detergent to help keep the engine clean. And their reasoning, of course, is that if you keep the engine clean, the engine is more efficient, uh, the fuel burns better, and it produces less harmful emissions, which then helps air quality. Now, this really did seem to help the problem, and it really was a big step from the days when you didn't really find detergents in gasoline unless you put it in yourself. So, so far, so good, right? Well, this you know, this is good for a while, but it doesn't solve the problem forever. Over time, things start to change, in such as, for example, engine technologies. Engines change, engine technology improves, and while that, you know, in general, that's a good thing, what the industry starts to find in later years is that they, find, they start finding that the, the LAC requirement doesn't seem to be working as well as it used to for removing things like intake valves deposits. Now, why is this? You know, what changed exactly between then and now? What was the cause for this drop in effectiveness? Well, if you consider that uh, when the LAC requirement was introduced in 1996, the engine technology back then was relatively simple or simplistic compared to the modern engines of today. So, 
If we ask how have engines changed since 1996, the answer to the question is they have become a lot more advanced than they were when LAC was introduced in 96. And this has effectively changed the engine's needs with respect to the amount of detergent in the gasoline that's needed to keep the same levels of clean that they did back in 1996. Now, uh, if you compare engines from 1996 to the engines that are used today, the difference, the technological difference between the two, it really is night and day. Uh, up to 1996, most engines um, required, you know, they had poor fuel injection, they had non-adjustable cam timing, they had turbo, uh, turbocharging was, was uh, more of a rare thing. It was not as widely used to boost engine performance. So as a result of, of, of these, these older engine designs, the engines were not pushed as hard in terms of thing, measurable things like uh, brake mean effective pressure, as a whole, they were not as efficient. They were less efficient than they are today. And, and the emissions regulations coming out of them were less stringent than they are today. Contrast that with today's gasoline engines, which are pretty much are miles ahead of the older engines. They, have, they are more powerful. They utilize higher compression ratios. They have variable valve timing instead of non-adjustable cam timing. Uh, they use a lot more turbocharging and there's a lot more what they call gasoline direct injection models. So today's engines, they really are a lot better. They have more power, they are more efficient, uh, and they're cleaner. So, you know, they're more, they're, they, they give you more power. You know, today's four cylinder engines are uh, more powerful than the old six and eight cylinder engines used to be. Now, it used to be, I remember when I was when, when, when I was a young adult, you know, a four-cylinder, if you only had a four-cylinder, you know, that was nothing. Well, four-cylinders today are miles better than even six- and eight-cylinder engines used to be back in the day. And they, they, they accomplished this, you know, more power, better gas mileage, while at the same time being cleaner. So it's kind of like, you know, how they say you can't have your cake and eat it too. Well, in this case, you, you kind of sort of seem like you can. So more power, more powerful, more efficient, cleaner, but uh, these improvement in engine designs also makes today's engines more prone to the effect of engine deposits. And what we mean by that is that once engine deposits get in, are, are started to form in the engine, the engine's response to, it affects them to a greater deal, excuse me, to a greater extent than they would have affected the older engines. So, uh, we we ask ourselves, how do engine deposits manifest themselves? What are the effects that we see, uh, and why are these why are these a problem for the end user? So, building up of engine deposits does lead to noticeable changes in the way that the engine operates and the way that the vehicle performs. And these are some of the things that you can get. Uh, you know, rough idle first and foremost. If you get intake valve deposits, well, those can uh, have a, a really noticeable difference in the idle quality of the engine. Now, this is most notable when the engine's cold. Um, you know, you have valve deposits on there, and what happens is that they will absorb some of the additional fuel that's required for starting and running the engine. So the 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 engine you know, starts up and it's giving a little bit more fuel because it needs to, you know, get up the speed, get up the temperature. Well, these deposits will actually absorb some of that fuel and so that engine will start to run rougher than it should while it's cold. Uh, hesitation, you know, you press the gas pedal, you don't get that nice smooth acceleration, you start to get a little bit of hesitation there. And the reason for this is if you get intake valve deposits, and you get injector deposits, well, when you increase the RPMs of the engine, you know, when you get it, you know, for example, when you give it gas, when you're accelerating from a stopped point, you'll get a hesitation. And some of this is due to, uh, for example, airflow disruption. Some of this is due to that aforementioned fuel absorption by the intake valve deposits. Some of it, some of it, if the fuel injector deposits are are bad enough that they disrupt the fuel spray pattern, well, that can result in hesitation as well. And of course, when you, if you're a driver and, you, and your car hesitates when you press the gas pedal, what is your natural inclination? Well, your natural inclination is that you're gonna give it more gas. And so that 
uh, really accelerates the loss in fuel economy because you're changing the way you drive as well. Uh, third one, this is one that probably, you know, at least older drivers are even, are probably the most familiar with, and that is the knocking and the pinging effect. So uh, in order to achieve greater efficiency, today's modern engines, they are designed to run at lower RPMs with larger throttle openings and higher loads. In order to do this, they need more precisely controlled ratios of air and fuel. So, well, so, so far, so good. Uh, under these two conditions, you can get two similar but different conditions or effects can occur. Um, the first thing that can happen, um, if you have carbon deposits on the piston tops, and if you have carbon deposits on in the combustion chambers by the cylinder heads, well, what these deposits do is that they change the compression ratio. Uh, they change the ratio of space that's in there. And anytime you change the compression ratio, then that makes the engine more sensitive to the octane of the fuel that's being used. So we said detonation and we said pre-ignition. Detonation is the first problem. Now, what happens here is when the, when the spark ignites the fuel, you, of course, you, the fuel ignites and you get a flame front. And the flame front will expand. They will go out, um, and what will happen though is that it will compress the fuel air mixture in different areas of the combustion chamber. Um, and if you have deposits in there that aren't supposed to be there, then you will actually get a, a premature self combusting of the fuel, uh, which leads to the second problem pre ignition. Pre ignition occurs when you have carbon deposits in the combustion chamber and those deposits can get hot and they can actually begin to glow during the compression stroke. You would see them start to glow if you could see inside of the engine while it was running. So if you, so if you have a red hot carbon deposit in that combustion chamber, what do you think is gonna happen when more fuel is injected in there? Well, of course that fuel is gonna get pre-ignited. It's gonna ignite the fuel before the spark plug can even fire. And so you get a pre-ignition condition there as well. Either one of these, detonation or pre-ignition, either one of these can result in this knocking noise. And the knocking noise is uh, you know, one of the one of the explanations for it is that it's you know it could be pressure waves that are being generated and are knocking around inside of the cylinder head. It's it's basically the sound of the effects of the fuel igniting too quickly. And engine deposits in the combustion chamber can definitely uh, play a factor in this. Now, mechanics will say, well, uh, why don't we hear why don't we hear knocking and pinging like we used to? Well, cars over the years have become uh, uh, fitted with knock sensors. Knock sensors will actually detect if knock is happening, and then what it will do is it will change. It will tell the car's computer to change the engine timing and change the way the fuel, you know, the timing of the injection, uh, and change the way that the fuel is being given into the cylinder. And what that does is that will actually prevent, it will, it will even out that knocking and pinging so that you won't hear it anymore. So on the whole, that's a good thing, but that doesn't come without a cost. When this occurs, when the engine, when the computer changes the, the, the timing, then what happens is that it reduces the power of the engine and it reduces the fuel economy. And to make things worse, you don't even know, as a driver, you do not even know when this process is occurring because, of course, first of all, you can't hear the knocking. And second of all, if you were a little more technological savvy, let's say you have a code reader and you say, my car is not really running the way I think it should. So you hook it up, you know, you get one of those handheld code diagnostic code readers that you can buy for, I don't know, a hundred bucks or a couple hundred bucks. You plug it in. Well, uh, when when the computer is adjusting the timing to get rid of this pre pre detonation and this knocking and this pinging, it doesn't send any trouble codes to the engine control memory, so there is actually no record of this happening. So you don't know that it is happening. So uh, we said that uh, you know when, if 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 the car has to deal with pre ignition and knocking and it changes uh, the the timing of the engine, it will lower the gas mileage. When you start saying things like that, that's when the average driver starts paying attention, right? You know, people are really sensitive to the issue of gas mileage. Um, how, you know, how much? 
how much gas mileage could you possibly lose? Well, depending on how severe the problem is, excess carbon deposits can cut your fuel economy by 2 to 4%, depending on the engine type and depending on the driving conditions. And uh, it can also affect the engine's emissions. You know, today's engines, they are precisely tuned. They're, you know, precisely calibrated to help them meet really strict exhaust emissions. And they have things like catalytic converters as well that help them do that. But if you get carbon deposits in there, well, those can disrupt the flow of the air entering the combustion chamber, you know, around near where past the, the, the intake valves. And uh, these carbon deposits can also disrupt the flow and the pattern of the fuel being sprayed by the injectors. We mentioned that earlier. And both of these will prevent full and optimal combustion from taking place. And not only will you lose mileage, but they can dramatically increase exhaust emissions. Um, this, and, and this gets worse during the cold start conditions when the exhaust catalyst in that catalytic converter is not fully up to operating temperature, so it's not cleaning and, and neutralizing that exhaust as well as it should. So when you cold start the car, and you have engine deposits, you get the largest spike and the largest increase in engine emissions. Um, today's engines also have this gasoline direct injection, this GDI problem to contend with. And this is a different kind of engine design. And while it has its good points, it does have its own kind of deposit problems. So gasoline direct injection designs, what those do is uh, they inject the fuel directly into the combustion chamber rather than upstream of the intake valves. Now, on the one hand, doing it this way, you know, injecting the fuel past the valves, well, this is a significant design improvement that makes those engines significantly more efficient in a number of ways. So it's a better engine design. It's a more efficient engine design. However, these kinds of engines are susceptible to developing carbon deposits in the fuel injector tins. And these carbon deposits, well, those can, you know, th those, if you get carbon deposits in those inject injector tips, that changes the fuel spray pattern. And uh, that lead can lead to things like localized detonation. It can lead to inc incomplete combustion and drastically increase carbon monoxide uh, emissions, which are really bad. In fact, Testing, automotive testing has shown that um, uh, you know, if, if you have a GDI engine and you do not have enough detergent in that fuel, you can get a 20 to 30% increase in harmful emissions. So all of these facts, you know, all of these facts are things that the industry found when they really started looking more closely at this issue. And all of this uh, led the industry to conclude that they need to start recommending uh, an increase in the additive package that's found in the fuel. So you have the LAC requirement from 1996. You know, it's acknowledged by everybody that it was an improvement in the situation from the past, but unfortunately, times have changed. It's not doing the job as well as originally intended because it really can't meet the actual needs of the more advanced engine design. So, um, what the industry does is the industry decides to take matters into their own hands. And this brings us to 2004, the creation of the top tier designation. A group of automotive uh, uh, companies, automakers, they get together and they create something that they call the top tier detergent gasoline program or gasoline detergent program. Now, their aim was to develop a higher standard for gasoline detergency levels that would better protect the modern engines against intake valve deposits and carbon buildup. Now, an important thing to remember here, okay, first, you know, just talking about that, you think, hey, that's great. But if that was the only thing you knew about the top tier, you might get a few misconceptions. Um, an important thing to understand, first and foremost, is that when they talk about top tier, they're not talking about, strictly speaking, a detergency level. What they're talking about is a performance standard. A performance standard for gasoline, the fuel, 
that enables vehicle manufacturers if they if the view if the view if if it's put into one of the engines made by these manufacturers that fuel will ensure that that engine will continue to meet the original emissions and performance criteria over time and it will not drop off like it used to so top tier is not about putting more detergent into the gasoline it's about putting the right amount of detergent in there and the right kind of detergent in there so that the end result is where uh, it, it should be um you know it's and and so you know you you get engines that are more are are not going to be dropping off with their emissions as much as they used to and also consider this as well um the the top tier program was also about validating the performance of specific detergent chemistries that actually work. Um, in order to get a top tier designation, uh, the different detergent packages have, would have to actually be tested. And that's what we're gonna talk about here. Fuels that are part of the top tier program, they have to undergo extensive testing to ensure that when engines use them, they don't develop excessive carbon deposits and deposits in the, on the intake valves and in the combustion chambers. And this is good because uh, this means that any fuel brand that makes uh, you know, a top tier claim, uh, those, the, you know that those have to, had to have been confirmed through actual testing. It's not just marketing people that are you know, making this stuff up. Also, another, an, an, another consideration here, and this is, this is something that it's easy to make this mistake right here. Um, if you have a top tier gasoline, when someone hears the term top tier, psychologically, they think premium gas, they think better gas. And unfortunately, what the mistake consumers can make is that they, they can make the mistake that um, a top, all top tier gas, that top tier is only available if you have a premium gas, a higher octane gas, and that is just not true. Top tier has nothing to do with the octane level of the gasoline, has nothing to do whether it's called you know, high test or premium or mid grade or regular grade or whatever. It has nothing to do with that. You can have a regular grade 87 octane gas that is actually top tier. Top tier, the top tier designation can apply to any and all grades of gasoline. It's not just limited to premium gasoline. And that's an important consideration because that means that you as a consumer, um, or if you're a business person, that means that your customers do not have to make the mistake of buying premium gas just because they think that's what they have to have in order to get this extra detergency. So recall, that the top tier program came about when a specific group of automakers got together and they, you know, they, they looked at things and they made this determination that they needed a higher level of detergency to benefit the cars and trucks they make. Who are these automakers? Well, you have eight automakers right here. Audi, BMW, Fiat Chrysler, General Motors, Honda, Mercedes, Benz, Toyota, Volkswagen. Uh, that's a pretty robust group there. Uh, who's not in it? Well, I don't see Ford in there. And there's some other ones, you know, like I don't know, Porsche, <laughs> that's not in there. But by and large, you know, those eight are a pretty large, significant chunk of the entire automotive market. These are the eight automakers that have united in support of top tier gasoline. And these are the eight automakers that are specifically recommending it to their owners. Uh, with the goal of preserving the engine's performance and uh, maintaining an emission, you know, emissions quality over time. So all of these automakers think that top tier gasoline and top tier detergency level is a good idea. The question now is how how you know how good of an how good of an idea is it? How much more effective are top tier gasolines than the old LAC fuels at keeping the engine clean. What's the difference? Um, to answer this question, to examine this question, AAA stepped up. AAA conducted testing in 2016 on top tier gasolines compared to non top tier gasolines, or what they, what they might deem lesser gasolines. And this testing was to evaluate the effectiveness of these higher detergent levels to see if they actually worked. And what they found was some clear and some useful test results. 
Now, the, the, the testing protocol was done on a dyno. They used a PFI injected engine, which was the standard for the ASTM 6201 test. Now, the one thing to note is that it was not a GDI engine, but it was a PFI engine. Um, and that, and the, the actual protocol consisted of they, they drove the, the, the test engines on the old LAC gas for about 10,000 miles. This was called the dirty up phase, you know, because they want to, they're assuming that deposits are going to be formed. So they drive for 10,000 miles so that they can get carbon buildup. Once that's over, they take the engine apart, they weigh, they measure the deposits, and they know where they're starting. They then take the engines and they drive them for another 5,000 miles uh, with different fuel. And what they're looking for is they want to evaluate any effect, any cleanup effect on those deposits. So they drive them for 5,000 miles now, they stop, they take the engine apart, they weigh the deposits, and they see what the results are. And so what did they find? Well, you can see up on your screen that the first thing they found was that intake valve deposits, when using top tier gasolines, those reduced intake valve deposits by between 45 and 72%. That's pretty big. They also found that total deposits, when they combined or when they aggregated the total deposits, the intake valves, the combustion chamber uh, uh, deposits, and deposits on the piston top, those went down in total by 27%. And that was after 5,000 miles. Uh, keep in mind, though, that it didn't take 5,000 miles uh, reductions to be seen. They actually, you know, they were monitoring this, uh, this, this, the progress found was that they began to see differences after just 1,000 miles. So uh, this seems to imply that the, the top tier detergency levels are, were doing what they wanted them to do. So according to these results, top tier gasolines are demonstrably better at cleaning and keeping the engines clean. Um, so for drivers, that's good. For the environment, that's good. But the big question, of course, is um, do you pay for that difference? You know, it's one thing, and, and that's something that is always a consideration because uh, consumers have, have shown, you know, time and time again that uh, there's, you know, they are very price sensitive when it comes to gasoline. And you could tell someone that a given gasoline is the absolute best thing in the world, but consumers may not buy it if it costs 15 cents per more for gasoline per gallon, even if you could prove that they got, I don't know, a dollar per gallon more difference. People are funny that way. So one of the things that uh, AAA wanted to do as well is they wanted to see what, what's the actual cost difference in the marketplace between the, the, the improved top tier gasoline and the old LAC gasoline. And so um, what they did was uh, they did a survey of 39 different brands of gasoline across the country over a 12-month period. They surveyed them to track their costs um, because they know that top-tier gasolines are better at keeping engines clean, but they need to see how much more they cost. And so what did they find? Well, what they found was that, yes, top-tier gasolines, by and large, were more expensive. But how much more expensive? 15 cents? 20 cents, you know, 30 cents, how much more expensive were they? They were three cents per gallon more expensive. Well, now, now we start to think a little bit differently because they're better for your engine. Um, they keep your car cleaner, they keep your performance up, and they improve the environment. Uh, are people really going to be, you know, cognitively uh, 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 dissuaded by an extra three cents per gallon? Probably not. Um, where can you get top tier gasoline? Um, you know, it's one thing to hear about how great top tier is, but if you don't think you can get it, it doesn't really matter. Well, the list of top tier gasoline retailers is actually a lot more extensive than you might think. In fact, there are a whole slew of them, as you can see on your screen. Uh, you know, the ones highlighted in green are some of the more well-known names. Conoco, BP, Chevron, 
Citgo, Mobile, Shell, Texaco, uh, Exxon, plus ones, you know, regional ones, you know, Aloha Petroleum, uh, you know, Arco, you know, uh, Phillips 76, Quick Star, Quick, Quick, Quick Trip, both the KWIK and QUIK, Road Ranger, Shamrock. You can get top tier gasoline at all of these different retails. So chances are, no matter where you're at, you have access to top tier gasoline. In fact, it may well be harder to find to to find a non top tier gas gasoline than it is to find one that actually is. Um, so let's tie this together. Okay, Bell Performance, of course, we 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 make multifunction. Uh, gasoline treatments, ethanol defense, and Mixago. We've made Mixago since 1927. Ethanol defense was introduced in 2010. The final question that we want to consider is, you know, if Mixago and if ethanol defense have a detergent package in them, how does that relate or how does that compare to top tier detergency? Um, the, the long and the short of it is, you know, without getting into the hard data, uh, and the, the the hard chemistry of it. Uh, the basic answer to the question is that if you use Mixago concentrated gas treatment or ethanol defense, if you use either of those two at their normally recommended treat ratio of one ounce to 10 gallons, then though if you add those to LAC gasoline, then it will improve the LAC gasoline up to and beyond top tier detergent performance specifications. So this is a significant benefit. And if you add the, the, that detergent, if you add those detergent formulations, if you add Mexico and ethanol defense to top tier gasoline, it will improve them even more. And not only will you get improved detergency, but you will also get all of the other benefits that come in those multifunction formulations. You'll get the combustion improvers, you will get the, uh, the top cylinder lubricant. You'll get the water control for the ethanol, uh, the, the, the ethanol fuels if you use ethanol defense. So um, top tier gasoline is better than LAC gasoline and adding ethanol defense or mix go to either one of those makes it a markedly improved fuel as well. So that's the long and short of the whole of, of top tier gasoline and uh, gasoline detergency uh, uh, issues. Um, if you have any questions about this, um, you can email me at my email address up on the screen. Uh, my name is Eric Bjornstad, so the email address mine is ebjornstad at bellperformance.net. If you have any questions, shoot me an email. Just reference that you had some questions about gasoline detergency and top tier uh, gasoline uh, presentation. I'll be happy to help you in whatever way I can. Um, yeah, so definitely look forward to hearing from you. So uh, that's, our, that's it for today. Uh, I am Eric Bjornstad with Bell Performance. Thank you very much for joining me, and uh, I will see you next time. Bye-bye.